Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are here to announce two things. First, the relaxation of some of the public health orders, and secondly, uh, more financial supports for businesses and the arts and uh, culture sector. Uh, last Friday, you'll recall that Minister Audrey Gordon and as well as Dr. Brent Rusin announced that the current public health orders would be extended until Tuesday, February 8th to allow for additional time to confirm the trend in the COVID-19 data and its impact on the healthcare system. We are seeing some positive trends in the data throughout the province indicating that COVID-19 is starting to stabilize in our province. As those trends continue, I am pleased to announce as of February 8th, we will begin to lift some of the restrictions. These new measures will remain in effect for the period of two weeks until February 22nd. And new measures will take effect that will include changes to gatherings in private residences, retail, restaurant, license premises uh, ca capacity, and museum and art gallery capacity, as well as uh, capacity for sporting events. I will now pass it over to Dr. Rusin, who will uh, fill us in on the details. Over to you, well, Brent. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. Uh, last week, uh, we announced an extension uh, of those public health uh, orders. Um, we had uh, been looking at modeling and looking at trends, uh, many of which uh, were showing the uh, peak or pending peak um, or, or plateau at the time. Uh, we needed some more time uh, to look at those, uh, at those trends, so we were encouraged at the time but uh, weren't able to make a definitive call. Um, as this uh, week has, has passed, we see that uh, many of those indicators uh, continue uh, to be stable or trending in the right direction. And so we are getting a, a better understanding of where we are in this, uh, in this wave. So one of those factors that we look at, and one of the most important ones, is the, the strain on healthcare system. So we look at hospital admissions, um, uh, both uh, hospital admissions and ICU admissions, um, those that are positive for COVID-19. So these have been very important indicators. Uh, we've uh, broken those down uh, in the past as uh, in infectious and those considered uh, uh, recovered or, or non-infectious at the time. Um, but what we see is uh, as we have widespread transmission of Omicron in the community, um, we see uh, very significant numbers of people who are in hospital and test positive uh, for COVID. Uh, for, so for public health, as we look at um, our uh, need for restrictions and our path forward, it's really important for us to understand who's in hospital because of COVID, not in hospital incidentally related to, uh, to COVID. Um, and so it's, uh, um, we know that because Omicron is so widespread, we know that every person admitted to hospital is tested for Omicron. We're going to find out, uh, find people that were there for other reasons but happened to test positive for COVID. So when we look at hospitalizations, when we look at various ways of doing this through chart uh, audits, we see that um, about 60% uh, of those that we report that are admitted to hospital um, are there for reasons other than COVID. Um, so those are people that are found to be incidentally positive for COVID. So they would be in hospital um, for these reasons uh, with or without COVID. Uh, so we're looking about 40% of those that we report in hospital um, are related to uh, COVID. So this is uh, uh, still all those people need care. All those people that are admitted still um, uh, put that strain on our health care providers, uh, but it's important for us, public health looks at our, the need for restrictions, who is there for uh, COVID. And, um, and so certainly we see that, uh, uh, that split where um, in, in some uh, days up to about uh, uh, one third of them were there for uh, COVID. And so it certainly helps inform our modeling um, and our path forward. So we, when we look at ICU admissions in the same manner, they, uh, that is uh, flipped over. Um, we see that uh, about two thirds of, of people or about 70% of people admitted to ICU are there for COVID. Uh, so we see that that trend that the, the majority of people who are COVID positive in ICU are actually there for uh, COVID. Um, but about one, one third are there uh, for reasons other than uh, their COVID infection. 
Um, and so uh, it's certainly relevant uh, to the way we look at our numbers. Um, when we look at those ICU numbers, again, it's very important uh, to highlight the importance of um, vaccination. Uh, we see uh, the, uh, the benefits of vaccination still protecting against severe outcomes. Um, and uh, why we're really pushing our, our way forward continues to be uh, vaccinating uh, as many Manitobans as we can. So any Manitoban who's eligible for any of the dose, first, second, or third, please get that as soon as, uh, as possible. So it's uh, certainly been, uh, been a while uh, uh, since we've been able to uh, consider easing some of these public health restrictions. And so based on from what we're seeing and, and uh, things like hospital admissions and uh, case reports, looking at absenteeism rates from different sectors, we do see it's very likely that we've hit a peak in, in Manitoba for case generation. We still see in ICU some of that uh, uh, slowing trend, but still um, uh, upwards. Uh, so we can move cautiously uh, at this point. We all know that the public health measures were, were in place temporarily. They're always meant to be temporarily and meant to be in place for only as long and to the degree that they are uh, required. Um, so uh, the place we're at right now, uh, we are recommending that uh, new uh, public health orders take effect on Tuesday, February 8th. They will be in effect for two weeks. Um, and so some of those details, so uh, uh, loosening restrictions on private gatherings with more people allowed to be together indoors and outdoors, again with differential rules based on vaccine status. Um, adjusting capacity limits at many public places. Uh, so we're going to uh, maintain um, the proof of vaccine requirements at the places that they're required right now. Uh, we're going to maintain the 50% capacity limits where they are right now, what we're going to do is, is lift that maximum cap. Uh, we had these many of these places capped at 250. Uh, we're going to remove that cap. So it's still going to be proof of vaccine wherever that was required to pass, still be 50% capacity wherever that was required to pass, but removing that cap of 250 people. Um, we've had that uh, uh, liquor sales uh, to stop at 10. We're going to extend that to uh, 12 a.m. Uh, and as far as um, uh, sports, uh, we will allow tournaments again for uh, indoor and outdoor sports uh, and recreation. Uh, so over those uh, uh, two weeks, we're going to continue to monitor those trends. Uh, we know that the incubation period uh, for Omicron is, is shorter, and so our, our previous duration of restrictions were based on a much longer incubation period. So we feel that the two weeks is going to give us um, um, a better picture. Uh, of where we're at and again uh, consider a, a path to a further loosening of, of the restrictions. We know these are only in place uh, temporarily. Um, so we still uh, maintain uh, the proof of vaccination requirements um, but we, we continue to message to Manitobans the, the importance of receiving those, uh, those vaccines as soon as you become eligible. So we know Manitobans have largely stepped up and followed these rules. Um, the majority, vast majority of Manitobans have done their part and gotten vaccinated. Um, and we all know that our uh, path forward must be one to continue to remove these public health orders over time, but in obviously a cautious uh, manner. So um, again, because of what Manitobans have done, the actions Manitobans have taken, we're once again in this place to start loosening, uh, loosening our public health restrictions. So uh, thanks uh, to all Manitobans for all of your hard work. Thanks to our health care workers who have uh, given up so much during these uh, uh, tough times. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to uh, the Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rusin. And, and while today's announcement will be welcome news to, to many Manitobans, we recognize that many businesses will still be impacted by restrictions and will not be able to operate to their full capacity. And that's why today we are also announcing an expansion to the sector support program to help Manitoba businesses and arts and culture organizations through this challenging time. The expansion will provide a second payment to businesses that have been previously approved and affected by public health orders in place as of January 31st expand eligibility under the program to include event rentals, catering and photographers and extend the, pro uh, the uh, program intake period until February 28th of this year. 
Often described as the uh, first to close and last to open, we recognize how difficult this time has been for Manitoba's vibrant arts and culture sector. Uh, we are also allocating $6 million in new funding to the Arts and Culture Sustainability Program to support organizations in this sector that are negatively impacted and affected by the COVID-19 public health order restrictions. Moving forward, we will consult, we continue to consult with our public health officials and our stakeholders as we move through this pandemic and continue to learn to live with this virus. Assuming the COVID-19 data from Manitoba continues along the path that is projected, we will, we will be in a position hopefully to further relax restrictions in the weeks and months ahead. Situation permitting and based uh, off of what the data is telling us at the time, we will be looking to remove a significant amount of capacity limits and restrictions. Later this spring, we hope to be in a position of relaxing nearly all restrictions and moving to recommendations. I want to thank the over 87% of Manitobans 18 and older who have been immunized with at least two doses and to those who made the choice to protect the nearly 70,000 Manitoba children with a dose of the vaccine. To date, our province has administered over 2.7 million doses of the vaccine. We know that vaccines work. I encourage Manitobans to get their third dose when eligible to recharge your immunity to COVID-19. Getting your third dose of the vaccine decreases your risk of needing ICU care by 139 times compared to someone who is unvaccinated. I want to thank Manitobans who have made personal, professional and financial sacrifices and have done their part by getting vaccinated and following the fundamentals. I want to thank all of our frontline and essential service workers for helping to keep Manitobans safe during this pandemic. I am confident we will get through this together. Thank you to all of those Manitobans. And we're now open for questions. Madam Premier, we have the second highest death rate in the country due to COVID right now. We're averaging seven deaths a day. We had seven more today. How do you reconcile that with what you just announced? So um, what I will say is that obviously we, we've been working with public health to see and, and look at, at ways that we can reduce the restrictions for, for those out there. I think people are, are ready to get back to some, some normalcy as part of their life when it comes to deaths and how they're reported and in comparison to other provinces. I think we are looking and I've asked for those numbers to see and those comparisons uh, across uh, other provinces to see are, the, are we comparing apples to apples when it comes to this. And so, you know, we're obviously looking at that and, you know, but to all those Manitobans, we know this has been an incredibly difficult time. We know that, that there has been a loss of, of, of loved ones. And, and what I would say is as well to Manitobans, you know, that we will get through this together. It is a very challenging time. Uh, what we want to do is ensure, though, that, that, you know, all Manitobans will be able to have the access to health care outside of just COVID, but, but other, other things as well. And we're obviously concerned about those uh, who are suffering from mental health and, and other issues out there that we need to, to focus on as well. What would you say to the elderly, uh, disabled, and immunocompromised Manitobans who are living in fear right now? Those are the ones living in fear, not the general society that they continue to see this widespread Omicron spread. They continue to see, yes, it is milder on an individual basis, but you can, even if you, if you talk to medical experts, they say we're underestimating COVID deaths, not overestimating them as you just implied. What do you say to the families and people who are disabled, immunocompromised, and elder? What I would say first and foremost is get vaccinated and make sure you've gotten your fully, you're fully up to, to being vaccinated and you get the extra dose, uh, the third dose as well. Um, I think that, you know, obviously these are very, very challenging times. We don't want people to be living in fear. What we want to do is, is create an environment here that, uh, that Manitobans don't have to live in fear. So you're suggesting those people aren't vaccinated? Is that what you're saying? No, to the extent that they're not, then, then they should be, but I believe that most of them are. But to their families and loved ones who may not be, um, to, to those people uh, as well, to encourage as many Manitobans to get vaccinated as possible. I understand the vaccination messaging that you often go to. I appreciate that. It's an important message. But I can ask you for last message. Time. What do you have to say to vaccinated people who are immunocompromised, elderly, or disabled? 
I would say that we've had, uh, you know, restrictions in place to try and help, um, you know, with our hospital system. I think what uh, we're seeing, and I'll, I'll ask Brent to maybe comment on this in terms of the number of people in, in, in hospital, the, the hospitalization numbers and, and ICU numbers that we've seen, um, you know, plateau. And uh, I think that, you know, that's what the restrictions were in place for. As we're starting to see the movement towards the trend that we are, I think we're, we're in a position to be able to, um, to reduce those restrictions so people can get back to, to living, um, living their lives. How much of this um, was demanded by businesses? And I'm talking specifically about the removal of the 250-person cap. We're now going to see thousands of people in large venues like uh, downtown hockey arena and some uh, casinos potentially. Um, is, is that not an additional risk? And who, who asked for that cap to be lifted? So what I would say is is that um, certainly we are listening to those in the business community. You recall uh, three, four weeks ago when we extended uh, the orders then and we extended it uh, another week. Um, businesses are constantly reaching out and giving us their perspective. It's why we've announced um, further supports for some of those businesses uh, today. Uh, with respect to the orders uh, that are before us today, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Brent as well to, to comment on these. These are things that we work together, that we work together with, with public health on. Yeah, and so I mean this follows our typical approach to as when we were loosening restrictions, they, we loosened them in the reverse order of what we put them on. So we, we uh, added these restrictions late uh, and you'll see uh, and then those were the first now to, to, uh, to be removed. So it's pretty uh, a standard uh, approach that we've had for our um, cautious loosening of, uh, of restrictions over time. And despite the, um, you know, the, all the evidence we've seen is that if you're fully vaccinated and you're not immunocompromised, you, the chance of having very severe outcomes from Omicron is, is quite low. But if you have a large crowd, you will get immunocompromised and people at risk in, in that crowd. Um, are, are you comfortable with allowing thousands of people in an area, even if they have to be fully vaccinated? So, I mean, the, the risk will never be zero, right? So people who are living with immune compromise, with severe medical conditions, they've uh, always been at risk of, of many different things. They've been at risk every respiratory virus season as well. And, and, and uh, if we see another variant or... Uh, you know, who knows what COVID will do next respiratory virus season. People who are in those conditions are, uh, you know, are unfortunately at increased risk. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we've, uh, we have a lot of measures still in place. Um, so we do have pr uh, proof of vaccine requirements. We have uh, masking uh, that will be required. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll never have a, a zero risk. And then some, uh, you know, people will have to consider some of their own risks as well, like in um, pre-pandemic times uh, as well. And we were messaging this from the first wave of the pandemic, that if you're at increased risk, you need to reconsider how much uh, activities you, uh, you take uh, place. So even before we had our first restrictions, we always had that high-risk messaging as well, and, and that, that uh, doesn't change. The reason Manitoba hasn't gone with uh, a two-household bubble for me, like, like some other provinces have, to limit that extended, prolonged, close indoor contact that we see in household gatherings? You know, with the, with the private gatherings, I think every jurisdiction has, has struggled with what's the, the right way to do this, right? And it's a balance between one is um, we want to limit contacts, um, but we need to do so through messaging and through orders that are really difficult to enforce. And so what's the best way to do that? What's the, the clear way of doing it? Do we say it's, it's one other bubble or two other bubbles? What does that bubble make up? Uh, or do we say a list a, a specific number? And so I think every, every jurisdiction has struggled that. We've considered it. And, um, and I think we've taken different approaches before. I think it's, just, it's really challenging to limit gatherings in a private residence. Uh, it's, it's important. But I think most of that relates to, uh, you know, to our messaging. Um, uh, to, uh, to do whatever you can to reduce those, uh, uh, those gatherings. And then of course, if you're at increased risk of severe outcomes, then you need to uh, consider uh, reducing those even more. Dr. Rusin, medical professionals have clapped back at this notion of with COVID, from COVID, saying that a lot of people, yeah, they're not there primarily because of COVID, but COVID is a systemic illness and it causes a lot and exacerbates other problems. They also say that there's a lot of people not getting medical care right now uh, for all variety of reasons in the health system because there is so many COVID infections, even the ones that you classify as strictly COVID. 
So I, I know you're not from the shared health system side here, but how, how what do you say to those doctors uh, that say that really we're still really struggling in the healthcare system? Well, I think there's, I mean, there's certainly strain in the healthcare system for lots of reasons, right? As the, um, we've seen absenteeism, we've seen the strain over, over two years, there's backlogs and things. So, so I mean, there's no, no doubt there is that strain. Um, do we use um, uh, public health restrictions and remove liberties solely based on, on, on that strain if the strain isn't uh, entirely based on, um, you know, directly related to COVID. These are kind of those balancing that the challenge we have. Uh, so when you talk about the, you know, the roughly 60% of the hospital emissions that we um, uh, announce each day, if they would be there either way, they're there regardless of COVID, they just happen to have COVID, it, it's certainly uh, not irrelevant. It's certainly, um, it's certainly relevant to how we um, consider moving forward with our, our restrictions. But no doubt is that, a, is that in any way saying, to depict that there isn't a strain on the system, but it's certainly relevant to us that you know 60% of the people there uh, would be there regardless of COVID. So when we're looking at our restrictions, it's something we need to consider. But but absolutely, uh, the message is not to say that there isn't a strain on the healthcare system. There, there's lots of reasons for that. You know, Premier, since you were appointed Premier, have you gone to visit a hospital yourself? And you are. I see you to see it yourself firsthand. Trying to think if I have been in. I guess uh, not since I've been Premier. No, I haven't. Why not? You know, I, I think it's out of respect for, um, you know, for the, for the public health orders and not wanting to be in a position where I'm going in and potentially uh, infecting. Uh, further, I think uh, you know we're certainly in discussions, and I, I rely on our, our Minister of Health, um, and uh, you know to 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 reach out in, in those circumstances. I certainly am not opposed to going and doing that. I, it's basically been out of uh, an abundance of caution, I would say. Premier, in mid December, we had about 381 million left in contingency for COVID-related things. Uh, I know that we've spent 22 on on more business supports and I'm guessing that's what you're matching today. So how much is left and why not offer more to buy us some more time? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, um, you know, we, we offer these programs out there and then we see what the what the uptake is and we try and and uh, and change them accordingly to ensure that we can offer more supports to as many Manitobans uh, as we can. And so what we have heard from uh, the business community, from the chambers and others that they that they appreciate these supports uh, to the extent that there's more that we can do. I think we are doing more. We are reaching out down to the arts and culture sector. Uh, there may be uh, some other supports that are needed down the road and we'll we'll gauge what those will be and and um, and uh, take it from there. What is our uh, supply looking like for the treatment for people who uh, like monoclonal antibodies, Paxlovid, et cetera? Yeah, and so that was, uh, we originally received um, uh, roughly 1,100 treatment courses uh, for uh, Paxlovid, the oral antiviral, and so uh, that, that is run through through Shared Health, so details on on uh, the distribution thus far should, uh, should go to them. Premier, you've spoken up in favor of vaccination. Your health minister's called herself a vaccine ambassador, but not everybody in your caucus is acting like a vaccine ambassador. Um, I'm just wondering, what, why is that, and is there anything that you can do to encourage your caucus to be more vaccine ambassadorial? I don't know what the proper term is, but, um, and, and can you do that while maintaining your support in those areas of Manitoba without alienating people in Winnipeg where most of the voters are who will see that your government gets re-elected or not? Yeah, I think what's really important is that as a government from day one, once the vaccines were released, um, uh, you know, we we, be, we all became or you know became ambassador, ambassadors within government to ensure that that as many Manitobans got vaccinated as possible. Uh, to the extent that those were in positions that you know were were saying some things contrary to that, they've been removed from those positions. We'll continue to have those discussions in caucus. I think it's very important that caucus members have the ability to represent their communities. We have a very diverse uh, group of individuals within our caucus. They have uh, every right to represent their constituencies, those that, that uh, uh, elected them, and so we have those discussions in caucus. And if they're undermining we the, the message... Phone right now, Carol. We'll come back to the room after. Thanks. Thank you. A reminder to our reporters on the line, you will have one preliminary and one follow-up question.
Up first this afternoon from City News, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, Mike Albanese from City News. Uh, my question is with all the other loosenings of restrictions, um, Manitobans were able to look at tangible stats and see that infections were on a downtrend that less people were testing positive, but with the current restrictions to testing, we can't necessarily go and see how many people are infected with the virus. A lot has to just go on the word of public health officials. So Dr. Rusu, what can you tell Manitobans to make them more comfortable with the fact that we are restricting while there could still be a lot of virus in the province? Yeah, well, we know there is a, a lot of virus, uh, right? And so if we th thought that there was uh, really no risk, we would loosen, uh, you know, lift all the restrictions. So, but we're not, we're doing so in a very cautious manner. Uh, we presented modeling last week uh, that, that shows where that, uh, that, that peak likely has been and, uh, and the, uh, the path forward. We redid those models and they show us the same thing this, uh, this uh, week that we've uh, very likely peaked in cases, very likely peaked in hospital admissions and are um, either peaking or, or peaking soon regarding uh, admissions to ICU. We look at uh, industries or sectors where there is uh, much more frequent testing and look at absenteeism rates and their test uh, rates and we see those are all uh, showing us a peak um, uh, uh a week or two ago. So there's a number of indicators that we look at and we've actually we presented those um, uh, the uh, the modeling last week. So uh, you're right things have have changed in the way we we look at things because of the testing approach, but we still have a number of indicators that we've presented. Thanks for that answer. Um, and with the loosening of restrictions. I know we're not pulling all restrictions right away, but that does add variability. Do our projected numbers, our projected cases, our projected future outcome, does that not go a little out the window when we start adding these variables in as such as not a cap of 250 people at a hockey game could have tens of thousands? So it's why we, you know, continue to message uh, many, uh, you know, many of the factors, you know, the fundamentals that we talk about. It's why we move things very cautiously to see those effects. Um, and because you're right, there is some unpredictability when we, when we loosen certain measures. Um, there, there's just no way, uh, you know, around that. And that's why we move cautiously and evaluate the effect before we loosen, uh, loosen further. So, um, so I think, again, uh, these measures, the public health restrictions, uh, they have negative effects as well. Um, and so it's a matter of trying to, to find that balance, which is, which is difficult, but we feel based on the modeling, based on numbers, we see this is a, um, a, you know, a, a pragmatic approach at this point. From CTV Winnipeg, Jeff. Oh, hi. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. I had trouble getting in. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Rusin, uh, Steve's already asked about it, but um, I, I take it then with the lifting of that cap, uh, I guess uh, the Jets can start having, if they want, uh, uh, higher capacity limits? That's correct. Yeah, so, so venues such as that, sporting venues, would be proof of vaccine, 50% uh, capacity, masking, uh, but there uh, isn't a, a cap on the, uh, on the total. Uh, okay, and, and both, yourself, both yourself and the Premier have, have alluded to this, but do you have a timeline mapped out, you know, after the next two weeks of, like other provinces have done, like, here are some key dates for when we're going to start to loosen other restrictions. Do you have kind of a map? Well, certainly it's a thing that we've, we're always discussing, you know, the, the, the short-term and medium and long-term approaches to, to things. So we don't have specific dates. Um, and, and it's really challenging to come up with uh, specific dates. I think the message is that um, given where we are, uh, we are right now, um, if, uh, if we don't see anything unexpected, that we're looking at a, a restriction-free Manitoba by spring. From CHVN, Taylor. Hi, good afternoon. I'm looking at the health orders here, and I see that for places of worship, there was quite a big uh, jump in how many people could attend, particularly uh, without uh, proof of vaccination requirements. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, why you decided to do this? Well, uh, uh, the uh, so this is referring to the... Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So we have in place of worship right now. There's a 50% capacity with no cap, similar to other other places. They had a 25% uh, capacity, um, or you know, 25 people. Although they could get to 20, 250 people if they cohorted. Uh, so at this measure, we just loosen that, uh, remove the cohort requirement. So it's 25% capacity or 250, whichever is lower but not the need to, to cohort. Thanks. And when you were making these orders, uh, what did you hear from religious leaders about this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, with, uh, with public health, again, we've, uh, when we are loosening uh, restrictions, we sort of just go in the, um, you know, in the reverse order of them uh, coming in. So this is a very moderate, modest uh, loosening of these uh, these restrictions. So public health hasn't engaged with uh, with religious leaders at this point. This is all about um, a, uh, a cautious uh, reopening when we're just seeing our numbers starting to uh, uh, plateau. So we only felt a, a very cautious reopening at this point was warranted. Well, obviously, we have a ministerial working group that works very closely with stakeholders in the community, uh, including our faith-based community as well. So we're in constant contact uh, with them about the, about uh, um, the orders as well. Uh, they reach out from time to time. We reach out to them, and we, um, as we do with all stakeholders. From CJOB, Skyler. Hi guys, uh, I know I asked you, uh, Dr. Rusin, about this last week. Um, just looking for a little more context to some of these hospitalization numbers. I know we have, you know, around 1,500 medical beds in the province. Uh, maybe a couple hundred of them were open last week, if that. Uh, and of course, now you're providing the, um, you know, with or because of type data. Um, but in terms of context, where does this, um, you know, compare to say like 2019, 2018, when you know, the hospitals were filling up slightly because of the flu. Obviously, we're seeing way more deaths because of COVID-19, but just trying to put that hospital situation into a little more context for people. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think I'm going to let um, a shared health answer any details of that. Uh, there's a lot of context uh, that we have to put in, into place now. Um, there's uh, staffing issues right now that we didn't have, say, in 2018. Uh, there are... Uh, issues on, um, uh, you know, delayed surgeries and, and things of that. So, uh, so it's not going to be essentially, an, you know, an apples to apples comparison on how many people were admitted this time in 2018 compared to right now. But the, the details of that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll allow Shared Health to answer. Okay, I appreciate that. And just as my follow up, you know, we're looking at a potentially a restriction free Manitoba in just two or three months time. A lot of people may not be comfortable with that, but it is the beginning of this clawing back of restriction kind of ushering in an era where folks uh, who are immunocompromised, are elderly, are at higher risk of some severe outcomes, uh, need to take that responsibility into their own hands and it's not being put on the general public with broader orders? Is that is that kind of the era we're going into now? Well, I mean, I think that's, the, that's our pre-pandemic era, uh, right? We, we fo uh, faced uh, many... Um, health challenges uh, pre-pandemic. Um, we unfortunately saw many um, uh, deaths and severe outcomes every respiratory virus season, and the majority of those occurred in uh, in unvaccinated uh, uh, people, and and as well people with many underlying uh, conditions. Those who are older, those who are immune compromised. So, um, you know, when speaking about this, you can you never. Uh, um, Never want to downplay the tragedy of, of all of these events, um, but uh, but moving forward, uh, we do have to uh, find ways uh, out of these public health uh, uh, restrictions because we know we're always going to have uh, challenges um, on uh, you know some of the sickest uh, Manitobans, and so we definitely need to find ways to protect them, but it can't be to. Uh, um, restrict the entire population forever. We've been at this for two years. At some point, we have to find a way um, out of that. From CBC Radio Canada, God Love. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I just want to raise a concern about the truckers uh, with the Premier because um, 
we know the truckers are coming back. Uh, there was a legislative assistant who was expelled because of his support to the truckers. And now those truckers are planning to have a sitting in front of the Winnipeg legislature. Hello? Yes, we, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, so uh, they're planning to have a sitting in front of the Winnipeg legislature uh, as from Friday until you relax restrictions. What will you do, Premier? Please. Well, obviously, we want to ensure that everyone is, is safe, and uh, I know that um, on the legislative grounds that uh, justice will ensure that uh, there's proper security in place to ensure the, the safety of, of all of those individuals uh, on, the, on the ground. I do want to say that um, you know, to our truckers, they have allowed um, us to be able to live through this pandemic. They have uh, allowed the supply chain to continue and, and have supplied us with our, our food and our clothing to wear. And so I think we should thank them as essential service workers uh, for what they do. Um, you know, I did send out a, a letter uh, last week, I guess, uh, just explaining, you know, where I felt on, on many of these issues. Uh, I am concerned about um, the mandate that the Prime Minister put in place because I am concerned about supply chain issues and inflationary issues. Uh, we had a different approach in Manitoba when it came to, um, you know, our, our provincial employees where we looked at uh, mandate, you know, either get vaccinated or, or get tested. Uh, there maybe is another way uh, out of this to ensure that we can continue that supply chain, which is absolutely critical for not just Manitobans, but for Canadians. Yes, but if I just have to follow up, uh, somebody was asking whether there is a map we can follow after February 22nd, what will be, what, what is coming next? Uh, you could see the part of population uh, who are supporting the, 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 the truckers. Uh, don't you think that some people are tired of the restrictions? Is there anything, are we going to lift more restrictions in the next weeks or the next month? Well, I'll, I'll start off with that uh, and then um, hand it over to Dr. Rusin as well for his comments. I think he's already sort of stated that this is a cautious approach to, to opening up, uh, but all, obviously our end goal is to be able to remove all health, uh, public health restrictions to ensure that Manitobans can get back to living uh, normal lives. So we, I think we all have the same end goal in mind. It's just that we need to take uh, perhaps a cautious approach through this to ensure, um, you know, uh, that uh, our health care system is there for Manitobans when they need it. From the Brandon Sun, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for for uh, fielding these questions. Uh, mine is more about enforcement because we have a company here that was uh, recently fined for uh, re uh, refusing uh, the mask mandate. I had just gotten back from a meeting with them, and um, yeah, just the general uh, consensus from them and uh, allegedly from their customer base is that they're tired of this. And But also looking at uh, stats for uh, fines, uh, I see a, a lot more have been uh, ticketed for uh, mask uh, refusal or failing to comply. So is this uh, uptick in the last 30 days because more people are refusing to wear their masks or is there just more enforcement? You know, I, I think it's uh, it could be a combination of both. I think people are generally getting, you know, there's COVID fatigue out there. I think we've all seen it uh, in our various communities and, and we, we all feel it. And so, but obviously when it comes to uh, enforcement, I know that, uh, you know, we have been tracking uh, not just the ticketing side of it, but the warning side of it as well uh, for, for individuals uh, as well. So I know Justice is starting to, to track uh, those numbers as well. I think what's important here today is that this is the start um, of uh, the, the loosening of restrictions. Um, we will be moving towards lifting all restrictions at some point when it's safe to do so. And uh, I think that what we're asking for Manitobans is just for, for patience through this. Um, we're, we're, everyone's tired of, of the restrictions, everyone's tired of COVID, um, but we need to ensure that uh, we also take that balanced approach where it comes to um, you know, making sure that we uh, are protecting our hospital system, but also ensuring that Manitobans can live their lives. Okay, thank you for that. 
And uh, for my follow-up, uh, just related to that, a lot of people have been asking a lot of questions. It's been more than two years. Uh, a lot of money has been poured into uh, restrictions and f uh, funding for supports. Um, uh, they would like to know why there ha hasn't there, uh, uh, exactly how much investment has been made for uh, shoring up the healthcare system. Yeah, well, you know, every year we have uh, increased the budget for, for health care. We have put special supports in place through the COVID pandemic as well and, and will uh, continue to do so. Um, obviously, we have a challenge with surgical and diagnostic backlogs. We have set up a task force to develop a plan to get us through that and uh, we'll continue to work with them closely on that. I know that's top of mind uh, for Manitoba. And so there will be more investments that will be made over, over time in the province of Manitoba. Uh, as, on Friday, our Council of Federation uh, is getting together and meeting about this very issue with respect to the Canada Health Transfer. Uh, the federal government is going to have to come to the table and work with us on this. It's not something that, uh, that uh, provinces can, and territories can shoulder alone. We're all in this together and we're going to have to ensure that we work together on it. So I appreciate uh, your, uh, your question very much. We now return to the News Conference Theatre. Thank you. Following up on Gordon's question about the truckers and the convoy, um, one of the things that the MP Bergen said in, in the House was that um, she, she um, said that the toppling of the statues and the defacing of the statues on Canada here, uh, she um, said that was, you know, equivalent to the protesters who were, you know, waving Nazi flags and uh, desecrating the, the war memorial. I'm just wondering, do you think that that is a fair equivalency to compare what happened on Canada Day here with statues and angry, you know, protesters over the deaths, um, of the graves that were found in residential schools? with um, the scenes of, the, the symbols of hate that we saw on display out here in front of the building and in Ottawa with the convoy protests? Well, we certainly understand, um, you know, with, with residential schools, the hardships that, uh, you know, First Nations have, have, uh, have, have gone through. And we want to work with them through reconciliation and ensure that we're helping them get through this very difficult time. Uh, I don't condone any kind of um, violent behavior anywhere at any time and uh, I don't think and I, I believe at the time there were some First Nations leaders who came out and said you know that that we don't contone you know the behavior of of, of um, you know what what happened there and so you know I, I would I would agree with that uh, but there's no question that we need to work very closely with Indigenous communities to help them heal through these very difficult times and that is of course uh, a priority that I have mentioned in our throne speech I mentioned it in, in uh, my inaugural address when I became became Premier, um, reconciliation is, is a priority for our governments. That wasn't her question. Do you consider it equivalent to topple a colonial figure statue with showing a Nazi flag? And I'll say it again, I don't condone any violent behavior anywhere. I don't think it's right. Premier, with respect. Do you, well, you see it's equivalent? I do not condone any violent behavior. What's worse though? Is one worse than the other, do you think? I believe that question is asked. I've answered that question. Different question, Dr. Roos and Armadam. Premier, when you uh, had this plan to relax restrictions on Tuesday, what response did you get from Perry Gray and the various specialty leads in the uh, health system? Well, we have frequent uh, discussions. We, uh, uh, Dr. Gray is part of incident command structure as well, so we have various uh, uh, discussions, um, you know, about uh, about our approach, about their planning, uh, and so we don't you know, discuss necessarily the, the, the details of, of the response and they're, and they're varied. Well, it's not a big detail I'm asking for. Did you get a thumbs up, a neutral, a thumbs down? Like, what was the general tone? Well, it's, it's not as, as simple as that, right? There's various restrictions at various levels. Um, there's, uh, you know, we look at various scenarios with the modeling and, and we take in a number of considerations, right? So the, uh, their responsibility is for uh, the acute care system and the capacity within there. We have a much broader responsibility to the overall health of Manitobans and, and, and things. So, uh, so it's not as simple as just um, thumbs up or thumbs down. Are you what happens a year from now? If we look at the, we won't really get a real picture of this until we see excess death numbers through StatsCAD in well into 2023. Uh, so, a year from now, are you confident 
that the approach you're taking right now is the right approach, knowing what, that we will see excess death numbers next year? Well, you know what? We, we, we uh, have to work with the, uh, with the numbers in, in front of us. We know that there are um, many aspects of, of, of health uh, and, and COVID is one of them. COVID is a, uh, for the last two years, has been a strong focus of the healthcare system, of public health, um, but it's not the only factor uh, related to health outcomes. Um, so when we, when we look at the risk of COVID um, and talk about restrictions, um, we really can't do that thoroughly without looking at a thoroughly what the um, harms related to the restrictions were. And so these are very challenging things. So I know that uh, looking back in, in retrospect um, is going to be a lot easier than having to deal with it in, in real time. Do you think with small, with small businesses on the changes to capacity? Because if everybody's still at 50%, but you lift the 250 maximum, that really benefits big venues. And small venues really haven't changed if you're a licensed premises or your bar, or restaurant, that sort of thing. Yeah, what has changed there is actually moving from um, 10 o'clock to midnight to allow them to be open longer as well. We recognize, obviously, that there are some hardships with those those restaurants and and uh, and those and the bars and bu those businesses. And uh, obviously, that's why we're introducing further supports for them today. We recognize that that these are challenging times. Premier, Thank you very did much. Forget, folks. Did you forget about Thank the, you, Kara. The, the not disclosing the disposal of your assets? You were housing minister in 2019. And last week when we asked, you know, you had declared them as assets and then after they were sold, there was no disclosure or statement filed saying that you had disposed of them. You were housing minister at the time and Manitoba Housing, uh, there, were talk, there, were, there were plans to devolve Manitoba Housing. Like, can you explain how there would be an oversight, like how you can forget about $30 million worth of assets being sold? Well, first of all, Manitoba Housing has nothing to do with this. But secondly, I did disclose the disposition of those assets. Uh, so they were disposed of the, you know, and they were declared in my conflict of interest uh, forms. The next conflict of interest form that came that came about in my and, and disclosed as well in my meeting with the conflict of interest commissioner. What uh, the issue is that I didn't file the form two, I think it is, within 30 days of the disposition of those assets. So to say that these assets, the disposition of these assets, was not disclosed is wrong. Well, it, it was. It wasn't in the they were. Office. Wasn't in the clerk's office. It is. It is in my conflict well, of interest was, forms, and I. It, is it now. It wasn't for two years. No, it was. It was absolutely. Um, it, it was there because as I filed my new conflict of interest form, those assets were no longer there, and I have my meeting with the conflict of interest uh, commissioner. And why are those not there? Because they've been sold. Right. You know. So. Are you required to file a statement? That you but that's the form two, them. which I said, There's you know. There's no form two. There was no form two last week, and your office confirmed that. Well, because once it's already disclosed, you can't go back and file another form. It's well, already disclosed. It wasn't disclosed. It wasn't in your file, and your office confirmed that. Yes, it that. is disclosed. No, it, I would suggest you talk. It was an oversight from your press secretary yeah. that it was an oversight. I believe you can send those questions to you. I have. Well, <laughs> it is disclosed. When, so to well, say that it hasn't been disclosed is wrong. I was told it was an oversight and it would be disclosed immediately. Dr. Do you want to answer one more about modeling? Just because we are on the way out. The paper wants to go. Uh, we can send it to you. Okay, no problem.